Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Beloit College and welcome to our 12th annual Weisberg Chair in Human Rights Address. We're very glad to have you here and we're particularly honored to be joined by our new friend and current Weisberg Chairholder, Dr. Yuri Jablazi. While other parts of the alliterative world prepare with breathless anticipation for, say, the annual Academy Awards, or Super Bowl Sunday, or the Final Four. At Beloit College, we alliterate with a more alliterate bent. At Beloit College, our breathless anticipation centers on the holy, wonderful, wild, woolly, and worldly Weisberg Week. <laughs> if you have not been to many campuses, you might think that every school has the equivalent of a Weisberg Week. You might think that such a smart idea, namely bringing someone to campus to interact with faculty, students, and staff, someone with a worldwide reputation for promoting core issues of human rights, someone with a proven record of stimulating effective change in a world too often antagonistic to such change, bringing someone to campus who has lived such a life of purposeful consequence, bringing someone to campus to interact with faculty, students, and staff, not for an arm length visit, a drive-by lecture, a one-night stand, a collect my speaker's fee, and on to the next college, to bring someone to campus for a full contact tour of duty. You can sleep next week, tour of duty. You can't be serious, tour of duty. The knot for the week of heart or body, tour of duty. The my God, they were serious about the running shoes they gave me on day one, tour of duty. You might think that such a smart idea would be everywhere, at St. Olaf, at Williams, at Middlebury, at Yale. But you would be wrong. Only Beloit College has a Weisberg Week. Only one college, Beloit College, has a wide, wide world of Weisberg Week because only one college can lay claim to having been the baccalaureate origins of the one and only Nina Weisberg. Thirty years ago, a bright, energetic, rebellious 18-year-old Nina Weisberg eagerly came from her home in Washington, D.C. to Beloit College. She graduated four years later, brighter, more energetic, and learningly rebellious, having earned a degree in English and having developed a passion for anthropology. Pretty Beloitish, sufficiently Beloitish, that she is now a member of the Beloit College Board of Trustees. So happy was Nina's father with her education, and this is important, because there is little Little, at least within the sad and narrow world of a college president, little better than a parent who is really, really happy with his offspring's <laughs> education. So happy was Nina's father with her education with this school, Bloy College, that he committed to helping the college establish something new, substantive, and central to the mission of the college, something that would draw from the college's strengths and history and speak to the college's future, something that would matter, something that would compel the most important international relations experts and human rights advocates in the world, people like Dr. Yuri Jablazi, to accept an invitation to spend time, real time, significant time, opportunity cost oozing time at this college. This parent was Marvin Weisberg, the benefactor of the first Weisberg chairs, the Weisberg scholarships, and the related program in international human rights for more than a decade now. He and his family have provided our community with unparalleled opportunities to connect and learn from some of our world's most inspiring, influential, and tireless practitioners and advocates for human rights, peace, and international relations. relations. We have the alliteratively wise and wonderful Weisberg Week. We have a week with Dr. Yuri de Blasi because we are fortunate enough to call the Weisberg family our dear friends. And they have shared their vision. They have partners with Beloit College to bring their vision into fruition. And it has become for us the exemplar of what it means to have a week devoted to the liberal arts and practice. Because of this vision and this support, because of the Weisberg family, this college is for this week, frankly, better than anywhere else. <laughs> Winning.
it is only right then that we pause for a moment in recognition of Marvin Weisberg, his daughter Nina, who could not be with us tonight, his daughter Wesley, who is here with us tonight, and her daughter Eleanor Weisberg, who I can hope will be here in a more serious way starting in, say, 2016, and thank them for their generosity. The success of the Weisberg family vision requires the attraction of a Weisberg, excuse me. Much of what it means to bring this vision into fruition is the expenditure of many, many hours of work by many, many people. But let me call out three. Our Manger Family Professor of International Relations, Beth Dougherty, our Director of International Education, Betsy Brewer, and our Associate Director of International Education, Josh Moore. It is their tenacity and focus on the importance of an undergraduate education at Beloit College that emphasizes the integration of internationalism in every department and program on campus, a mission that is at the heart of the Weisberg Residency, that helped earn Beloit College one of last year's Senator Paul Simon Awards for campus internationalization. Please join me in thanking Beth, Betsy, and Josh for conceptualizing, developing, and implementing a framework that makes the most of this precious opportunity and that promotes the mission of this great school so effectively. It is terrific to see so many of you here tonight. Let me turn over the podium to Professor Beth Dougherty, who will introduce our, speak our featured speaker and honored Weisberg chairholder. It is my great honor tonight to introduce the 2012 Weisberg chair, Dr. Yuri Jabladze. Dr. Jabladze is the founder and the president of the Center for the Development of Democracy and Human Rights, and it is through his work at this center that Beloit College became aware of him as a Russian human rights activist. He actually started off life as a cardiologist. He is the child of two doctors, um, but in the mid-1980s, he began to hear a different calling, that of human rights. One of his first um, uh, involvements was with the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War in the mid-1980s. He then began to um, move into activities where he could empower Soviet citizens to get involved in nonviolent social change. Right? And as the 1990-1991 era moved on, it became a very exciting moment for Soviet then Russians to begin to seize the opportunities to exercise their democratic citizenship. He also has done work in inter-ethnic conflict mediation. He was the coordinator of the Committee Against the War in Chechnya. And then he went to Columbia University, uh, the School of International Public Affairs, uh, where he received his master's degree. In 1998, he founded the Center of De um, Development of Democracy and Human Rights. The center's work um, focuses on public policy research, on the protection of NGOs uh, from persecution, the application of human rights treaties, combating xenophobia and racism, the development of alternative civil service for conscientious objectors to the military draft, and general advocacy campaigns on human rights. Um, his time here this week has been wonderful. Uh, he has shared his insights and his experiences um, with many, many students. Uh, we'd like to thank Yuri for the inspiration uh, that he brings to the pursuit of human rights. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yuri Jablase. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you very much, Scott. Good evening, everybody. Um, it is uh, truly an honor and privilege to be here at Deloitte as a Vice Bev Chair. To have an opportunity to spend intensive and wonderful week uh, at this great place, to meet with the faculty and students, many of you in this room, 
already had have had a chance to to meet and talk um, and to share my perspectives and learn from you and it is great to have a chance to speak to you tonight I also want to say personal thank you to Betsy, Beth, and Olga, Josh, and many others who have taken very good care of me and my family with a great hospitality and warmness. Thank you. And I would like to extend special thanks and appreciation of Maron Weisberg and the Weisberg family for the opportunity for me to come and for your many years of commitment and support to the development of international and human rights programs of Belmont College. Belmont College is um, a very special place, as I learned during my week. Um, at the campus, I have been able to learn firsthand that its excellent reputation is well deserved. It is a place where traditions of intellectual freedom, freedom is preserved, where excellent teaching and advanced research are combined with commitment to the community service and international cooperation and where students have excellent opportunities to learn and grow to study abroad and engage in civic advocacy here in the US and there are many great people here which are probably the biggest asset both among faculty and the students I have really enjoyed being with you well, I live and work in Moscow, as you have heard, and um, I run an NGO there called Center for the Development of Democracy and Human Rights, which I established in 1998. And I started my civic and political activism about 25 years ago. In fact, I think it is exactly 25 years this year. Um, and it was at a time when the Soviet Union was undergoing fundamental change during Glasnost and Perestroika of Mikhail Gorbachev, who believed that he could transform communism into a more humane system, what he called a socialism with a human face. It was probably the most exciting time in my life as an activist. As the communist system was becoming increasingly incapable of functioning both economically and politically, millions, millions of people were demanding change. This is half a million people demonstration in downtown Moscow in the March of 1991. People protested in the streets, voted in the first relatively free elections, demanded truth about history and present day, and the space for freedom was opening up. Every month, boundaries of the possible were expanding, and the space for freedom was opening up every month, oh, sorry, history was happening literally before our eyes and we were part of it. When the forces of the past, the conservative communists, tried to stage a military coup in August of 1991, unarmed people surrounded the government building in Moscow and defeated the Putschists by civilian non-violent resistance. It was very gratifying to see how these hundreds and thousands of Moscovites uh, practiced the very principles of nonviolent social change that we tried to bring them in uh, the work of my first organization. And the Soviet Union ceased to exist uh, quite soon and what promised to be a democratic Russia emerged in its place. During the 10 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the country lived through very turbulent times of painful democratic transition and controversial market reforms. In 1990s, Russians survived an armed conflict, an armed fight in the center of Moscow between the rebellious parliament and President Yeltsin, the first brutal Chechen war, an unfair privatization, the oligarchic takeover of the media, dubious elections of Boris Yeltsin for the second term, and a financial default of the whole country. Despite of this very uneven transition process with tremendous social dislocation and suffering by many people, basic democratic and market institutions finally were taking shape and were put in place. However, economic instability, 
inefficient governance and a danger of separatism in the Caucasus led the oligarchs, the oligarchic elites, to prompt Boris Yeltsin to handpick a successor, an unknown former KGB colonel Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. Yeltsin later confessed that this was a fatal mistake. During the 12 years of Vladimir Putin's rule since the year 2000, he has built a highly centralized authoritarian system where democratic institutions have been systematically eroded, rule of law undermined, and fundamental rights and freedoms increasingly restricted. Uh, this is just a short list uh, of major human rights problems in Russia uh, that my organization, many of our colleagues deal with. They are fundamental and they uh, are quite serious across the board. Um, quite soon the limited gains of the democratic transition of the 90s have been almost all but eliminated. Putin successfully used the real threat of terrorism to abolish in the name of security elections at all levels except national, expanded the powers of the security services, the FSB, established control of the parliament, the judicial system and the media. He also took away property from many oligarchs that ruled the country essentially in the 90s, pushed some of them to exile abroad and put in jail most vocal opponents amongst them. And installed his own friends and cronies in power positions and put them in charge of the same economic assets. Putin successfully manipulates with fear, talks about enemies surrounding Russia and portrays himself as a protector from threats and the savior of Russia from disintegration. Putin benefited tremendously from skyrocketing world prices for oil and gas exports from which make the basis of the Russian economy. Price of oil went more than 10 times compared to the previous decade. Thanks to this, as well as the beginning of functioning of market institutions established um, by reformers of the 1990s, living standards under Vladimir Putin have steadily grown and people indeed are much better off economically. Putin reached sort of a deal with the nation, sort of a social contract. I guarantee you with a permanent increase of living standards and you do not engage in politics and let me run the country as I wish. Most agreed. Those who did, who did not have been persecuted and harassed. Among them was the well-known oligarch Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who challenged Putin and is serving now 13-year term in jail on trumped-up charges in a politically motivated trial. Opposition political parties were closed down and refused to re-register. Critics were marginalized and human rights groups and democracy organizations have been portrayed by the government as enemies of the state and puppets in the hands of hostile foreign governments. Subjected to smear campaigns and pressure. Most tragically, a number of independent journalists, civil society activists and human rights lawyers became targets of threats, physical attacks and a few of them have been murdered. The most dangerous areas of work uh, include lawlessness and terror in the North Caucasus, xenophobia and racial violence and corruption of government officials. I knew most of these um, people who were assassinated um, personally and worked with many of them and it is a very personal matter. Among them were journalist Anna Politkovskaya, human rights activist Natalia Estimirova, human rights lawyer Stanislav Markelov and the corporate lawyer Sergei Magnitsky. Inability and unwillingness by the government to investigate these crimes not only makes a blow to journalism, human rights work and the legal profession, but creates an atmosphere of impunity and permissiveness for these crimes. 
when Dmitry Medvedev became a president four years ago and made strong statements about his intentions to conduct reforms and modernize the country, both economically and politically, many people hoped this was for real. More and more people increasingly felt that the system was not working as a result of colossal corruption and the inefficient governance where civil servants are not accountable to the public because of absence of free and fair elections. More importantly, Putin's social contract has stopped to hold. Oil and gas prices do not grow anymore. And after the global financial crisis in 2008, Russia cannot heavily borrow on the world markets as they did before the crisis, when money was in abundance. As a result, there is no more increase in living standards. Despite the fact that Medvedev was not able to deliver on his promises of reforms, atmosphere in the country has changed and expectations were growing. Many people believed uh, or hoped rather that Putin will not run for presidency and if Medvedev runs again for the second term or someone else's, else runs, not Putin, then there will be still a, ch a chance for change. Well, the announcement by the two politicians in September last year that they will simply change seats and Putin again will be president and Medvedev a prime minister uh, and the fact that they had decided it long ago outraged thousands of people. People took it as a personal offense. Um, the fact that everything already was decided and their opinion was so openly and shamelessly disregarded. Elections didn't matter. And it was the most educated, the younger, living in big cities, using the internet, having traveled abroad, knowing foreign languages, having professional training, the most dynamic part of the population that took out to the streets. Uh, driven by the sense of moral outrage and rejection of manipulation by the authorities and lack of respect to their human dignity. It has been indeed mostly a moral protest, not so much a political agenda, political demands at the beginning at least. People were not standing behind any particular political party or alternative candidate and importantly 80% of the participants of the demonstrations and marches came out to the streets for protests for the first time in their lives. A lot of young people. Um, and um, the typical slogans um, were really based on moral rejection and of 12 years of lies, says this slogan. And and to the power of thieves and crooks, says this one. Um, this person has a white ribbon on his head. I have a couple of them with me here. These white ribbons became a symbol of the protest movement, symbolizing um, fairness, transparency, um, accountability, and um, what was really important is that people stopped to be afraid. The fear was gone. For a long time, um, there was political apathy among the majority of the Russian population and only a handful of political activists would take out to the streets in protest and they would always be beaten by the police very brutally, taken to custody, spent a week, two or longer terms in jail. But when people suddenly came out to the streets and saw that they were, in fact, thousands together, they realized that the fear was gone and the police could not do anything about it. 
because when you deal with a crowd of 50,000 or 100,000, you cannot use the brutal, repressive ways you are used to. What is really characteristic of this sudden awakening of the Russian public, in addition to the moral demands and moral outrage, is the political diversity of the participants. Um, there are all sorts of people, all sorts of uh, political and ideological views ranging from communists to liberals, the orange flags of the liberals, to other liberals, to yet some other liberals, there are many different groups. And one more group of liberals, smaller, um, and yet one more, who had their own candidate in the elections, who was able to uh, get registered. Social Democrats, ultra-nationalists, very uncomfortable. I once had to spend about two and a half hours during a protest demonstration in the midst of these neo-Nazi types, and it is very difficult. Um, anarchists, the pirate, <laughs> those who read Russian, the pirate party, uh, LGBT community, feminists against the monopoly on power. Um, this uh, um, <laughs> diversity of power. Uh, was uh, of political views was very important because uh, it was essentially a liberalist movement. There was no clear single political party or a leader in charge, and it was indeed the internet and the social networks that were the primary tool of self-organization and mobilization of the protest. Participants. Um, many politicians tried to appear as or act on behalf um, as leaders of uh, the protest movement, but they failed. In fact, it was not politicians, but those people whom the protest uh, protesters saw as moral authorities who emerged as spokespersons and coordinators of the movement. It is writers, this is a famous Russian writer, Lyudmila Ulitska, rock musicians, Yuri Shevchuk, journalists, Leonid Parfenov, and the like. They soon established a coordinating body called the League of Voters, which they underline as being not a political organization and it's in its manifesto, which is short, one page, half a page really, they say about we demand fair elections, fair courts, fair police, fair media, fair government. So it is really about the fundamental principle of fairness and accountability of the government to the people. Um, the key demands of the protesters um, are the following. The investigation of the electoral fraud at the parliamentary and the presidential elections, which are seen by good half of this population, again, I repeat, most active, dynamic, educated, um, professional and so on, as fraudulent and they do not recognize the elected parliament and Vladimir Putin as legitimate authority. So, investigation of lethal fraud and punishment of the perpetrators, swift adoption of a democratic, liberal legislation and political parties and elections, and as soon as this legislation is adopted, fresh new elections in a year from now. Um, according to these new rules, release of political prisoners and the list 
has been delivered to President Medvedev. About 40 names are there. And more generally, demand for a comprehensive political reform. When you look at what people want in this political reform, most often people speak about reform of the justice system, because people don't get justice in courts. It is effective fight against corruption and ending of the government control over the media. Naturally, much anger is targeted at Putin personally as a symbol of an authoritarian and corrupted system. This poster calls him the crook and thief number one. Uh, not, let's not let the tyrant into the Kremlin. Well, that you can read yourself. Pretty harsh. <coughs> or another version. This. Actually, many people say that, you know, the day when um, the man will have to leave um, his um, privileged position um, should not let him to escape to some nice place with his uh, wealth. Uh, that he and many others in the ruling elites should be held responsible for crimes against humanity in the Northern Caucasus. Uh, for many crimes uh, in economy uh, and human rights. So these sentiments of holding them accountable and putting in jail are quite typical. Um, for Russia without Putin, Putin go, and impeachment to the future president, and again, the same um, analogies. Um, people remember all the terrible things Putin has done. The explosions of apartments in Moscow that led to his ascent to power. The submarine that sank. The theater uh, drama of storming. Um, the theater with the hostages and the deaths of hundreds of hostages. The school in the city of Islam, again the storming of the school with numerous casualties and victims. Death of Anna Petkovska, the story of the Yukos company and many other elements of his track record. Young people are very much involved, as I said, and um, people have been very dedicated and are coming to the streets in an extremely cold weather. It was around minus 30 in February centigrade, which is probably the same in Fahrenheit. Um, and people indeed spent an hour, two hours, three hours in the streets um, marching and demonstrating and making a point that democracy is not a phrase of the cold. That's what this young lady is saying, or we are not afraid either of Putin or of the cold. Um, people um, use their create creativity a lot. Um, not only it is a matter of solidarity and coming out in big numbers, um, but also um, using their minds and their creativity to uh, make a point. And uh, there is a whole collection of um, creative slogans, this one saying, we are not an opposition, we are your employers, you are fired. <laughs> uh, new leaders emerged, and this is very important for a long time. We've been told that if not Putin, then who? That he is the only guarantor of stability, um, and if he is gone, the country will disintegrate in chaos. And naturally, after 10 years of suppression of dissent and uh, political acti activity uh, and uh, opposition movements, uh, there are very few political leaders that are known to uh, the Russian public. And it is through this protest movement that new leaders have emerged who people really don't know across the country. 
many of them coming from civil society, such as the environmental leader Evgenia Chirikova, or anti-corruption fighter blogger Alexei Navalny, or the left-wing activist Sergei Udaltsov. Um, Putin now faces a very difficult dilemma. It's not surprising that he's not very happy after he won these elections because he has at least three, if not more, challenges. Well, first, the protest movement, these educated, younger, professional people continue to put pressure, continue to um, insist on change. At the same time, the other half, whom he promised to increase further the government paycheck, the social security, the pensions, the less educated older living in smaller towns and in rural area, who voted for him, they will now demand that he delivers on, the, on his promises. But he can't. There is no money. Oil prices don't grow anymore. And uh, suddenly the fire will come from the two sides. More importantly, probably, Putin is not seen as a guarantor of power positions and wealth by the same very elite people whom he represented and whom he created. He is increasingly seen as a weak president. The balance of power has changed in the country. Not only the mood, not only the atmosphere, but indeed Putin appears not as a strong leader anymore. And for the elites, he is becoming increasingly not an asset, but a liability. And they in turn start to think about substituting him by someone else without altering the very system of their power and control. It is quite obvious that things will never be the same. Um, Putin and Medvedev still having about six weeks to go are already given in. Three laws have been introduced, draft laws have been introduced by Medvedev in response to demands of the protesters on registration of political parties, on the elections to the Duma and on the elections of the governors, which is restoration of what was taken away by Putin just eight years ago. Um, and one of them on political parties already has been passed in just a month, very quickly. He also promised to review cases of political prisoners and many people are hopeful that at least some of this list of 40 will be released before Medvedev goes on May 7th. Of course, Putin will try to make as little change, as little concessions as possible, but he has not much room for maneuver. And the risk for, the, for him, obviously, is going too far. At some point, this incremental change happening under the pressure of the protest movement, as well as demands from those who depend on the government and their paycheck, will lead to the situation when the system will not stay as it, we know it now anymore. Despite fatigue from protests, naturally people have been going out to the streets for four months, and disappointment by some about the failure to prevent Putin's return to the Kremlin. Most of the protesters, and we speak about several hundred thousand people, stay very committed. Most people realize that it will be not an overnight change, that it will take time, but certainly not six years Putin will stay in power. Everybody is quite convinced that he will have to go and the system will have to change quite dramatically, substantially within maximum two or three years. Most of the young people are now discussing the different ways of staying engaged other than or in addition to street protests. Many tried to run in low-level municipal elections and quite successfully. Others engage in educational 
activities providing alternative information to government propaganda to those people who voted for Putin and do not um, understand how uh, problematic the existing system is. And it is really the young people who are the most creative and innovative in their activism. Uh, they will stay engaged and they're making a point by slogans like this. We will keep coming out to the streets until they go. And this uh, developments give uh, me and my colleagues a lot of hope that finally uh, we are going to live uh, through again major change like it happened 25 years ago when I was beginning my political and civic activism. Um, inspiration and hope that this new movement uh, of awakening of the Russian civil society and emerging uh, emergence of Russian political nations as many nation as many experts say uh, is indeed giving very hopeful uh, prospects for democracy and human rights in Russia. This was the title of my presentation as requested by Miller College. I thank you and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, drawn in the protest between um, this current situation and the um, situation with uh, Gaddafi and Mubarak. Do you think that there is a significant similarity there and do you foresee this going the way of those uh, protests and whatnot? Uh, I, I'm afraid I didn't hear the first part of the sentence because the, the, uh, the dynamic... Uh, certainly. Um, do you believe that this is comparable, this, uh, these protests are comparable to those against Mubarak and Gaddafi? And do you foresee it going in the same direction? Um, well, there are many similarities, but there are differences too. Uh, the major difference is that uh, much of the protests in the Arab Spring was driven not only uh, by the moral outrage about political abuse, but also about economic injustice. Not the case in Russia. Most of the protesters, as I said, are achievers, and they have something to lose. Returning of Putin for six or twelve years are, is a real threat to the prospects of their careers, their businesses, their families, and so on. So this is a major difference. Uh, however, it was also the moral this very strong moral component about human dignity and respect, lack of respect, absence of human dignity, that uh, drove people in Egypt and Libya as well as in Russia. People in Russia don't want to have violent revolution. They've uh, had this in the past and don't like it. Uh, and therefore, People make a point about nonviolent change, and uh, they would rather spend nights in squares occupying them as soon as it becomes little warmer, uh, rather than try to store the Kremlin or like it happened um, in Arab countries. Tom. Thank you very much for a wonderful speech. I rarely heard such a good, uh, very comprehensive analysis of a uh, contemporary Russian situation. And thank you once again for giving us uh, the broad per perspective. One thing that is intriguing me, is really interesting, you mentioned the uh, very diverse group of the protesters, and you've mentioned uh, communists, anarchists, ultranationalists, women of people and others and etc etc all the feminists uh, and I've heard the stories about the rock bands and punk rock bands being at the center of attention which is really amazing 
Do you, um, I have two questions coming out of your wonderful presentation. Number one is, do you see any uh, ground for a democratic left emerging in Russia based upon traditional Russian ideas of Kropotkin, uh, Bakunin and others, non-Bolshevik Russian, non-Bolshevik left, Lekhanov, etc., etc. Or, um, or we are going to go back to the, the Bolshevik um, Communist Party, and who was this electorate that voted for the left, for communists and, and, and other left parties, and a lot of people say the majority, a lot of people voted for them and they were deprived uh, of votes by Putin regime, that's number one. And number two is, what kind of similarities would you see uh, between anti-neoliberal protests in the West and this uh, anti-Putin neoliberal Putin protest in Russia? Thank you. These are very scientific questions. Um, and I have to be very non-scientific because of time constraints. Um, but later on maybe we have a beer or two. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I very much hope and uh, really see necessary uh, for a new left movement to emerge in Russia that would really um, represent the, the views and the demands of uh, those populations, those groups of people that um, currently vote for the old Communist Party, which is in reality not a Communist Party at all, but an imperial nationalistic um, ally of Putin, essentially. Um, we have, you know, groups of young people uh, who are of left views, um, but they don't have political organization. Some have small circles, discussion circles, or kind of local movements. Um, many of them, I'm afraid, are, are a bit too radical. Um, and we have this dilemma. You know, they see the example, the model of the official communists, which do not really represent the interests of the working people, uh, working class people, and the like, the blue collar workers. Uh, but, and they don't think that politics really, kind of organized politics in the way it exists under the Putinism, is a way to go for them. So they use more kind of a, um, often radical ways. Um, but we need such. You, 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 your point is very well taken. Uh, such you know, a new left movement. Um, as for uh, the differences and similarities with the Occupy movement in the United States, well, some of the Russian protesters tried to occupy the fountain in the Pushkin Square, in the, referring to in their public statements to the very term, will occupy and stay here until Putin is gone. But of course, it's not that easy and, and, and fast. Um, but in, in seriously, there are, of course, parallel in terms of parallels in terms of diversity, in, ter in terms of lack of a single organizing body that would coordinate and have a clear political agenda. It's more um, leaderless and sometimes a bit too disorganized, to be honest. Um, I was uh, present, not an organizer, but present at some of the meetings of, uh, of one of the organizing committees of the protest movement. There are several. Uh, and it is complete chaos and anarchy and service, to be honest. And maybe it's good for, for, for the time being. There is a lot of arguments. At what point in time should this protest movement um, split into clear
political groups and develop kind of a more comprehensive and detailed political agenda. So far, people believe that they should stay together with very basic demands of free and fair elections. And then, once this demand is met, they can compete. Maybe. You mentioned the emergence of new political parties um, with this new movement, um, but even with this in mind, when Putin does kind of fall from power, do you think um, that it's possible that a different oligarch could come to power, or that one of these new political leaders could kind of take on a similar role to Putin? And if so, um, do you think that? people would come out and do this again just to get rid of them and to make sure that free and fair elections would happen. Uh, well, although much of the anger and the imagery of the protesters is indeed targeted at Putin personally, as, as, as we have seen, yet everybody understands very well that it's not a matter of personnel. It's not uh, just Putin as a person, but essentially a system of Putinism, if you wish, as it has become to be known, uh, of this concentration of resources in the hands of a few, which also happen to be former KGB officials and friends, uh, and uh, bending of the laws in the interest of this group, and uh, no accountability and no free, free and fair elections, and so on. So, People are quite aware of the importance of addressing institutional problems and uh, pushing for adoption of the laws and making sure that they are implemented. Um, while some oligarchs may change, well, we know that Mikhail Khodorkovsky in the beginning was quite an arrogant type and didn't care much about democracy and civil society and uh, as time went actually he and as he met uh, with uh, Putin's ways and tools so to speak uh, he became more and more aware of, of the importance of the rule of law not only for the politics, but also for private property and for business, and he became quite a strong supporter of uh, civil society, uh, independent journalism, and political pluralism. In fact, ironically, he provided funding, which irritated Putin tremendously, to several competing political groups and parties, both to the liberals and the communists, because he felt that it was very important that there is a more diverse and sound alternative to this vertical of power of Putin. And um, so I, I don't think that in Russia we have a risk of uh, doing the same as people in some other countries did, like in Kyrgyzstan, like when they had three revolutions in five years, um, get falling into the same trap. So it's not so much about personality, but about institutions. You mentioned several times that the driving force behind the current opposition in Russia comes from the highly educated youth. So I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on the effects of the older demographic in the current political situation, if you would. Um, yeah, could you repeat yourself? I really, yeah, I was trying to, to, to find you and didn't hear you well. Yeah, that's good. Several times that the driving force behind the uh, opposition in Russia comes from the highly educated younger demographic. So I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on the contributions that the older demographic is making to the current political situation, if you would. Uh, well, as uh, I briefly touched upon in, in the presentation, uh, the older generation and this is, of course, a 
huge, huge simplification. Uh, the older generation statistically voted for Putin. Uh, and uh, it is a matter of them, most of them, dependent on the government paycheck and pensions. Secondly, 70% uh, of the Russian population still gets their news and information from the television. And it is the young people who have the internet, the alternative source of information, while the older, older people do not. So they receive daily injection of the government propaganda and quite naturally become indoctrinated. Uh, and uh, they are indeed afraid of change because they're being told of all the threats coming from the outside of Russia. Russia is a fortress under siege. There are enemies all over. You cannot imagine the degree of anti-American <coughs> propaganda that Putin engaged in during the election campaign. But it, not only Americans, there are all sorts of enemies. Also inside the country, including human rights organizations the opposition, etc. So they are frightened and he successfully manipulates with fear as many politicians do. So in that sense, uh, it is at the moment kind of the demographic demographics that works against modernization and, and, and change. Uh, and it is very important for the opposition movement, for the protest movement to reach out to this and explain that in fact they will be better off in a more fair society when the, the wealth, the huge wealth that the country has from its exports of natural resources will be fairly distributed, not controlled by a small handful of oligarchs and when you know the health system, healthcare system and, um, and the pension system will be working in the interest of the people uh, and not ignored essentially what is happens now, ignored by the government. I think we can take one more question, uh, and then if you would uh, please stick around because President Bierman has one last message after Yuri finishes answering this. Thank you. Uh, I'm hoping you could expand uh, briefly upon the role of both the in-state and international judicial systems in this opposition movement, and also if you have hopes for their roles expanding, what those hopes might be. Uh, role of the international and Russian judicial systems, legal systems? In the movement? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. I mean, uh, only if one day, uh, as some most idealistic human rights defenders hope, Putin will be transported to the Hague. To the International Criminal Court, although it will be very difficult uh, because Russia has not ratified the statute, <laughs> as the United States has not. So um, this is kind of a naive hopes, but in, in reality, the, the judicial system has been uh, an instrument. The Russian judicial, judicial system, an instrument in the hands of the government, uh, and. Um, it only was very strongly proved uh, when the hundreds of well-documented complaints about the electoral fraud were all, tur all turned down by the court, both in parliamentary and presidential elections. Um, and the protesters know also, so once they are, for example, detained by the police, it is the court is not the place where they can find justice and say, on the fact, I practice my constitutional right and it was the police who was wrong. The courts automatically take the, say, the side of the government. Um, international judicial system, well, only if in the sense that the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg have made a very substantial impact uh, on the understanding 
not so much on the practice of, of the Russian courts or legislation, uh, which has not really um, changed much, uh, but on the understanding by the Russian public, including the more educated and active ones, uh, um, about the gap between the international obligations of the Russian Federation and uh, the real life. There was an, one seminal decision of the Strasbourg Court about um, deregistration of one of the political parties which is led, or was led when it existed, uh, by one of the leading opposition politicians who was very active in the protest movement. It is the Republican Party, not very much resembling the American Rep Republican Party, just the name, uh, uh, headed by Vladimir Vyshkov, one of the uh, most impressing democratic politicians to my mind. So the Strasbourg court ordered the Russian government to restore uh, the registration. And it became an argument in the debates and street demands as well about the need for a change in the legislation of political parties because they directly contradicted the right for association as enshrined in the international law. Gary, why don't you come over here for a second? <laughs> the success of the Weisberg family vision requires the attraction of a Weisberg resident scholar who draws energy and endurance from a community unabashedly and unreservedly enthused about the potential of learning so much from a full week with a person of such consequence. Without this shared energy, the Weisberg chair would wither in the face of the storm of unbridled curiosity coming from the community. Without this shared energy, the Weisberg chair would curse the name of Boyd College in general, and Beth Doherty in particular, for having put up this murderer's row of events. Without this shared energy, the Weisberg chair would surely be the most uncomfortable chair in academe. But our Weisberg chairs, and this year is no exception, have fed on this shared energy and have left this college tired, exhausted, but also exhilarated, encouraged, and additionally optimistic about a brighter, more just future. We ask so much from these Weisberg chairs, and we have asked a shocking amount from Yuri, because our students, our faculty, our community, we are hungry, voracious, ravenous for the knowledge they have to share. Marvin Weisberg's vision predicts this and demands this. Marvin Weisberg's vision compels us to hang on every word and make the most of every minute, even on a Friday night. Because here at Beloit, where our students develop and hone a bottomless appetite for learning, it is, at the end of the day, the application of that knowledge, its practical service to both the students themselves and the worlds they inhabit, that is most urgently sought. You have been the embodiment, Yuri, of Mr. Weisberg's vision. Over this week, you have been an exemplar of what it means to be a Weisberg Chair in Human Rights. Thank you for being here. In recognition, and in appreciation of you and your time here, it is my pleasure to present to you a token of our appreciation, that token which includes an image <laughs> that is particularly meaningful to this community, a turtle. Do you love turtles, Yuri? <laughs> Silly question, of course you do.